detour her identity weaves a new way of living, one that includes Toronto's multi-ethnic multi influences and old familiar traditions. Aga Maximowska emigrated from Poland to Canada in 1988. She studied journalism at Ryerson University and education at the University of Toronto. In 2010, she completed a Master's of Fine Arts degree in creative writing at the University of Bach. She lives in Toronto. Giant is her first book. Please welcome Aga. CN Powers in some of my pictures. I have a whole, a whole set on Twitter that's called CN Powers, but they, but it's it's an incidental CN Power that just shows up peripherally, marginally, because it's so tall. <laughs> <laughs> and, and looking at a lot of the older pictures makes you think about Toronto now, or makes me think about Toronto now. Um, and, and the way a, a, a house, a residential house, could become a commercial enterprise. Somebody who knew how to do something, uh, had the capacity in their spot where they lived, to, to make a little retail uh, place and, and make a living out of that. Now we've sort of um, bylawed and zoned that out of, we, we can't do that. People can't adapt, like especially people uh, in the more suburban areas of Toronto or in um, some of the high rise towers of which we have well over a thousand. Um, if someone knows how to do something, it's a lot harder for them um, to find a space in the city to do it now. Um, it's more expensive now. But they just don't have, the city doesn't bend the way it used to bend, um, and that might be a price of being, knowing a little bit better that we are a great city now, and, and we've, we've got the bylaws that do that. Any questions? Yeah, we should talk. Questions about Toronto complaints? Do you see it get, getting dirtier in your photographs over the years? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a self. I like to think of my work as a celebration of a uh, vibrant, ever-evolving, living uh, city that's constantly in flux. And, uh, you know, and I, I can think back about my time here in the city, some of the areas I've been in, some of the time periods when it was dirtier. So I, I don't really, I mean, it's, it's always shifting and changing. the focal point that started this whole project for me was 140 Bolton Avenue. And it's gone now, but when I photographed it in 1980, it was a little, it was, it was one of those quintessential Toronto buildings that were impossible to date because you couldn't tell, there was nothing to give it away. There was no, there was no ornament, there was nothing. It was just a window, a door, and some Instagram. And it was a house, and but in 1988, when I re-photographed it, it evolved into a landscaping business. And um, 
and she, when you see the photographs, the changes were so dr dramatic. And it, it was quite shocking. But anyway, it was, it, that's that's the kind of building I liked the best because it was clearly you use the term tabula rasa, and I say blank slate. Same thing. Anyway, anyway, it's it can be rewritten uh, over and over by by occupants. And then you see the same thing even with buildings that do have more limitation, like your you know Second Empire style on one end or your Gothic at the other. They they also have lived well beyond the whatever uh, whatever agenda or whatever um, belief systems or whatever had led to that type of structure. This is it's long ago, and they've, they've had many lives since then and continue to do so, which always fascinates me. Of the center <laughs> the same question earlier. And uh, you want to talk first? Um, I, I love condos. Um, they're the future of Toronto. Um, if you were to if we were to transport ourselves back 25 years uh, and walk around downtown Toronto, we would be shocked, probably like like rattled at how empty the city seemed and how full of parking lots it was. Um, condos have filled in so many parking lots in Toronto and have given the city a sort of thickness um, that I don't think it had as much before, uh, or we would be surprised if we, if we went back. Um, I get upset sometimes about the, the conversation around condos because it, it tends to kind of go to where it's mis 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 misanthropy. Okay. I've been standing out in the pool for too long. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard word to say. It just seems anti people. Uh, that people will just say, oh, condos, right? It'd be great if we had a conversation more about design of condos, let's make condos really well designed, or uh, about affordable housing, let's make some of these things affordable. Um, but this is Toronto, this is, uh, you are welcome here, or I forget what the saying is, uh, we are the city that welcomes people from everywhere, and people are always going to be coming, we are a city of immigrants, and we want the immigrants to still come, it's sort of part of the you know, identity of the city, um, I think, I hope. Um, but they're not going to be able to live in, um, you know, Victorian homes in Cabbage Town. One, they're too expensive. One, we don't have space to build that stuff anymore. The future of the city is up, um, whether it's mid-rise or high-rise, um, and it will likely be a sort of condo-based thing. Um, so that, that collision of, of, of people who are here, it always feels like um, I'm here. I don't want anyone else here. Shut the gates. Shut the gates. <laughs> and the gates are open. And, and condos represent that. So whenever that conversation turns to uh, condos, I like to say, let's say, substitute condo for people. So, so is it the people you don't like, or is it the design of the condo? A design conversation is a good one to have in the city. Um, an affordability con uh, conversation is good. But the people thing, the people coming to Toronto, that's the core of what the city has been about from the beginning. I think, I, I think, you're right. Right. I think it's that change and on the negative side, I, 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 I lament the loss of affordable uh, industrial space for a multiplicity of purposes. So I, I, two different times in my life I've lived in warehouse spaces in the late 70s and early 80s. I eventually was evicted when the building I was in was converted to Berkeley Castle, Berkeley and the Esplanade. And that was a, an amazing building because it had people, you know, woodworkers here, um, some people from the fast Wars artists collected there. Uh, man's practicing here. It was pretty uncomfortable. We were, you know, we had to go two flights up to get hot water. But I still like there was such a wealth of that space available for so long that really did feed the uh, the arts in the city. And uh, that's what I lament most. I did I did a lot of photography in what is now Liberty Village and what is now the Story District and East Collins um, in the 80s. And those areas are there's. Just night and day. Do you think that um, on the same topic of condos, that's going to erase some of Toronto's messy urbanism? That um, it's going to lead to sort of a, a similar yeah. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the condos tend to be uh, uh, getting a few properties together, consolidating them, tearing everything down, um, whether or not those buildings are good uh, uh, or worth saving or not. Um, and then making kind of a mega block out of the same one designer uh, who, who tries to design uh, the storefronts to don't always tend not to uh, have that same kind of jumble. 
Um, what I would like to do if I was a fantasy uh, mayor, um, or we have a fantasy mayor, uh, <laughs> fantastic, uh, is, is to limit the amount of properties you can consolidate into one development. So we instead maybe we'd get a ton of little tiny towers, and they would each have their own little storefront, and that might allow for the jungle a lot more than, than having just a monoblock. Or in a sense to have maybe a subsid, instead of a subsidized housing system, you apply that to small business ownership so that the first floor of condos are not going to long-term leases for banks or massive yeah, pharmacies. Instead, you support local business by subsidizing them. Yeah, banks, there's no reason why we need a bank on every corner. We could just put a little teller or a little ATM there and then have the other stuff upstairs. Like, they don't need a lot of street front instead of a, uh, a waste. So more, more integrated into the community, both in terms of scale and in terms of occupancy. And, uh, and but it, it does have a, sense, a kind of a boringness that, that is the downside of having so few developers controlling so much sidewalk space. But that thing you mentioned about subsidized rents for, for retail, um, or or rent control, there's no rent control for, for retail. Um, so that's why we see um, like the strips like Ossington or, or Dundas West now, um, a from like Ossington to Lansdown, how it can change so fast and lose that, uh, the, some of the character and some of the kind of the places where people actually like, can buy a hammer and that sort of thing, and it all becomes cupcake and, and latte shops. Um, because those places can get priced out of out, out so fast, um, so they don't have the same you know, nominal protection that, that a residential renter has. That would be a, a provincial issue, and I, I don't see it being championed. The upshot of having a kind of knowledge economy or, or creative class economy or whatever uh, is that people can do stuff at home, whereas before they needed a little more space when it was more physical. Um, but the people who actually make things, it's much harder, I think, for them to do stuff. If you, if you have a garage uh, in, in, you know, in your back alley and things like that, you can, you can kind of get things into that space. Um, one of the interesting plans, still mostly theoretical, is tower renewal. Uh, which is uh, it started from ERA Architects here in Toronto, but now it's uh, there's an office in City Hall called Tower Ringle. Um and they're looking at the aging uh, towers that were built in the 50s and 60s and into the 70s, um, all around Toronto. Um, of which we have a lot in you know North Etobicoke and Rexdale, Lowe's in Scarborough, uh, and, and a bunch in, in, in North York. Um, and there's a lot of people in those towers that know how to do stuff. Um, they came from places where they made stuff. Uh, other countries and they had, you know, trades, but they come here and they're up in a tower and they don't have that same um, access to space. And so tower renewal, apart from reading the towers and making them, bringing them up to, uh, you know, to 20 teens, uh, they, they're looking at the social and economic side of it and trying to figure out spaces and in, in maybe in those green spaces that surround so many towers um, to provide stuff, uh, studios and, 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 and retail -y kind of shops where people who have all this talent in the towers can kind of come out and do exactly what um, the people did in 1920 or 1950 on Dundas West when they made a little storefront in front of their Victorian or Edwardian house. Um, we're trying to figure out how to do that with modern architecture with, with, with the way old, older architecture was has adapted. It's still theoretical, so it's not really an example, but hopefully it happens. And just one final Sorry, just one final comment about the condo thing is that it, it does tend to drive my project because uh, you know whenever whenever it tends to slow down uh, and there's a boom, I just need the time for me to go back and read documents and follow up on it. So, my project. Yeah, I have a question. Um, so 
once upon a time there was a saying that uh, Toronto is New York run by the Swiss in various yeah. forms it's been said that way uh, then it was the old city of Toronto pre amalgamation it's uh, compared with what we have now is Vienna surrounded by Phoenix and, and that's you hear it now and then I don't know how true it is but it, there's some basis there what might be the slogan tagline that's coming what are we becoming? Well, the Phoenix part of Toronto is, is a pretty interesting part right now. It's the, the, the inner suburbs. Um, that's where the most... Um, I, well, I write a lot about the, the strip malls in Scarborough and North York. Um, and, and these are kind of forgotten spaces in Toronto. People don't like them because they're car-oriented, they're ugly. Um, it's modern architecture, which, which has fallen out of fashion right now. It'll come back. Um, but you, you go down Eglinton East or Lawrence East uh, around Morningside and, and McCowan, um, right in the middle of Scarborough, and, and you walk along those strip malls, and they are exactly like what mom and pop uh, Main Street retail was like, uh, more downtown, pre gentrification, pre high rents. Um, when somebody who had an idea to open a uh, papaya shop or something, you know, could, could get the capital together and, and open a shop on Holly Street, whereas now they're, they're, it's way too expensive down here. Um, but the strip malls are functioning like that now, so they're the most exciting walks to have in Toronto, I think, um, because you never really know what you're going to expect. There's very few chains in the strip malls, um, but, it's, it, but it's not terribly beautiful in the, in the traditional sense of beautiful. I think it's a it's, it's this beautiful, ugly, wonderful Jungle. So the people somehow make it beautiful, and just their the, the creativity of, of their, the businesses that you don't like. You get so many unexpected things there, and there's no template for everything. Because people are doing it themselves. I don't know, Phoenix, Jungle, uh, Toronto. The mayor would probably want to call us the Chicago of. of, of <laughs> Thank you, Patrick and Sean. And if you liked uh, the sound of the book and you can tell us that it is a really beautiful and interesting book, um, please head over to the, uh, I think it's, I believe it's the author's sign tech, and I think that um, they'll be heading over there now to sign books, so get your copy and, and get it signed and sign and continue asking questions. Maxi Mosca tells the story of a young girl, Garcia, a Polish girl who's already difficult coming of age is intensified by an incomprehensible and sudden move to Canada. Garcia is forced to undergo the tumults of puberty in a foreign land.